All right, so review. Review. We've covered a bunch of kings. Too many. Too many to remember, probably. But let's see how you do. Who is the first king in Judah? <laughs> in the divided kingdom. <laughs> the first king is actually Saul. There's actually one before that. It's uh, Moses would be the first. Okay, so the, the king in the south under the divided kingdom is Rehoboam. How about in the north? Jeroboam. Okay, now, how do I do this? Um, we'll just go, I'll, I'll split the kingdoms up and we'll try to name them coming down. In the north, we have Jeroboam. Who comes after Jeroboam? Nadab. Nadab, good job. Who's after Nadab? Basha. Who's after Basha? Elah. E L A H. After Elah, who comes? There's two of them that come in real quick. Zimri and Tibni, that's right. Then after that, we have who? The beginning of pure wickedness. Who comes after Tibni? Amri. That's right. The house of Amri. That starts the dynasty under Ahab's rule. And so then after him is Ahab. And Ahab is who we'll talk about tonight. In the south, we have Rehoboam. Everybody knows that one. Now, there's not as many kings here, so you may remember some of these. Rehoboam. After Rehoboam? Good question. Abijah. After Abijah? Asa. Good job. After Asa? Jehoshaphat. That's who we're on tonight. Jehoshaphat and Ahab. We talked a lot about Jehoshaphat and Ahab last week, but we'll talk some more about them this week. In the south, 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Yes, he'll do that tonight. <laughs> That'll be 1 Kings 17, 1 is where we'll begin. In the north, Ahab um, has a prophet come up and give him some instruction. Elijah prophesies a drought. 1 Kings 17, 1. And Elisha, Elijah, not Elisha, Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord... God of Israel liveth, before, before whom I stand. There shall not be... I lost my place. Um, there shall not be dew nor rain these, three, uh, these years, but according to my word. So for three and a half years, he blocks, by God's order, rain and dew in this land. So that's a serious thing. When they lived, they didn't have a Walmart. There wasn't a target they could run down to and get some help, you know, when they needed something. They lived off the land, literally. So when there's no dew, there's no rain, there's no moisture. It's all dry and just blowing away. Elijah has to flee himself. You can't lay down bad news like that and expect to stay around town. <laughs> They're going to come after you. Elijah flees and he's fed by ravens. That'll be in uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 2, verse 2 to 7. And the word of the Lord came uh, uh, unto him, saying, Get thee thence, and turn east, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the book Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall, that's 1 Kings 17, verse 2 to 7. In 1 Kings. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So God allowed him to run. Running's not always bad. Sometimes God wants you to run. Sometimes he wants you to get out of the way. It was a real good idea for, um, what's his name, Joseph to run in Potiphar's house. Sometimes running's a good idea. Sometimes you need to run. And here he's, he's thrown a brick through the window and now he's running. He said, hey... By the way, just wanted to tell you, we're going to have a drought. See ya. 
out of here. <laughs> That's what he did. Verse 4. It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank um, of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Whose fault was that? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes he's prophesying there to levy judgment of God against this wicked king. But it affected him too. So that's why we don't want to glory in God's judgment. You find a lot of Christians do that. They act like they want to see God's judgment fall on a nation. No, sir, you're going to suffer. Your job is not to levy God's judgment. Your job is to hold at bay God's judgment. And it's just going to happen. He's going to judge. That's going to happen. And don't be surprised if you have to endure some of it too. That's that furnace we talked about on Sunday. But there he is. He's, he's having to suffer because now his brook's dried up. But I've shown you his ravens coming in. The raven there is an um, unclean animal. And I think the raven goes down and grabs him a steak off of Ahab's cookout every night, every morning. Brings it down there. You know, he wouldn't be eating raw meat. That'd be against the law. It says no blood. So it's fully cooked. Well, that raven got it from somewhere. I'll bet he got it off of Ahab's back porch. <laughs> All right, so Elijah's fed by the ravens. In the south, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat does something smart. I think Jehoshaphat is like most well-meaning Christians. Now, I hate to categorize it. A lot of Christians do this. They start out good for God. And then there's something in it that turns them off. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. You can get weary quick by the simplest things. And it may not be, sometimes it's, man, this gospel just sure seems negative. All I'm doing is telling people how bad and wicked sin is. I'm just sick of it. And sometimes that's what makes you get weary. Sometimes what makes you get weary is, hey... I'm all alone. Ain't nobody giving me any company. Nobody thinks like I think. You know, I'm just wore out and tired of it. Don't be weary in well-doing. I think that's what Jehos Jehoshaphat is. He starts out good, and then before long, he's joining forces with a wicked king. Now, we can speculate why he does that. It's not spelled out. But he says, hey, I'm just like you. Well, obviously, he wasn't just like Ahab. They were worlds apart. If he was just like Ahab, he would have disbanded his kingdom and gone and put himself in submission to Ahab. Well, obviously there was enough difference about them that they each had their own kingdom. Okay, that's a difference. <laughs> but he wanted to be accepted. You know, that's, that's the mega church over there. That's, they've got ten tribes. I just got two and a few stragglers that decided to show up. And so maybe he just got weary. He just got tired of it. He joined forces. Well, he did, but God knew that he was not the same. God spared him. He didn't spare Ahab. Ahab dies. Jehoshaphat doesn't. Ahab gets a redo. And Ahab straightens up after that. Or not Ahab. <laughs> Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Jehoshaphat straightens up after that. But that's a lot of Christians. You'll see them do that up and down thing they start out good they'll be doing great and then all of a sudden you just they just wore out they're tired of it and you see them go back and play with the world for a while and then if they've got a heart for God it won't be long they won't be satisfied with what the world offers and they'll be back and that's a good thing here he is Jehoshaphat he seeks the Lord and his kingdom is established he does something good. He removes the high places. 2 Chronicles 17. 2 Chronicles 17, 3. 
2 Chronicles 17, verse 3, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam. Good job. But sought unto the Lord. Okay, it's not enough just to not go to the wicked thing. A lot of Christians think that's the answer. The answer is, I'll just quit doing wickedness. That's not the answer. That's part of it. But you've not completed the formula. You've got to quit doing the, good, the bad thing and start doing the good thing. He said, I'm not going to worship Balaam, and I'm going to worship God. So he did that. Look at verse 5. Therefore the Lord, therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. Okay, so God decided because of his actions, because he turned from Balaam and turned to God, that he would establish him. God doesn't have to do that. And he does that, though. That's just how he is. That's how he acts. So don't stomp your feet and demand him to do it. Know that that's what he will do. His timing is different for everybody. <laughs> this guy got established real quick. Your getting established may take years and years. Mine may take years and years. But it'll come. Verse 6. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. He's doing the right thing. This guy got on fire. He took the throne and he said, we're cleaning house. That's what you're supposed to do. The northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, Elijah's still out there causing havoc. Uh, he's sustained. He, remember, we saw him at the brook. The brook's dried up. So now God says, hey, um, let's move on up in the world. He says, go to Zarephath. I've got accommodations waiting over there for you. And of all the places to send him, he sends him to a widow woman. God likes to use the, just the things that don't seem like they'll work because that shows him. So he goes to this widow woman. Now, it wasn't a widow woman who was well off. I mean, that would make sense. She didn't have anybody to spend money on, no kids, and, you know, just lots of houses and property and stuff, and, you know, she could lend one of her houses to him, but it didn't happen that way. She's got a little boy, and they're about to die. They don't have anything. So why would he send her to her, of all people? But he does. That's the way he works. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. First Kings 17, 8. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. <laughs> Notice how polite God is. Would you like to move on to the next town? <laughs> looks, think, looks like things are getting slow here. Can I compel you to? No. Get up and go. Get thee. <laughs> Which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called, her, he called to her, and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, she's going to make a big fire, <laughs> that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Okay, she says, We're going to die. We know it. I've gotten just enough in the barrel that it'll make us one last meal. I came out here and did just enough work to get two sticks so we could get a little fire going. <laughs> I'm not going to do any more than what is there. If I got three, three sticks, then the fire would be burning after we were gone. But we're just going to eat this and we're going to die. Verse 13, Elijah said unto here, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. Wait a minute. That's not nice. Okay, don't worry about it. You can go die, but first of all, <laughs> that's what he says. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after that, make also for, for thee and thy son. Okay, you want to die? I understand that. That's not, 
That has nothing to do with me. What I'm telling you is go get me a cake. If you want to die, you can still die, but get me a cake first. Wow. What manners. Verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she did. And the barrel doesn't fail, and the oil holds out, and he's sustained, and she's sustained. So, Elijah is taken care of in the midst of pure wickedness. So will you and I. In this wicked world, and it seems like every day it's getting worse. It is. All you have to do is listen to the news for about 10 minutes, and you see Satan's hand heavy. He's working. He's working overtime. But, hey, that's not us. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We're being sustained by something much greater. God will take care of us. We don't have to worry about it. Elijah restores life to this widow's son in verse 17. In verse 7, uh, 1 Kings 17, 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sins to remembrance and to slay my son? That's the first thing we think of. When something happens, we think, What did I sin? I sinned, and this is what I deserve. Now, a lot of times that's the fact. <laughs> a lot of times that is the answer. But not always. Sometimes God just puts us through the fire because he's purifying us. Sometimes it has nothing, look at Job, it had nothing to do with what, anything he had done wrong. God was proud of what he was doing, but he still went through the ringer. Verse 19, And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, and carried him into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, thou, uh, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came, came into him again, and he revived. Um, it didn't say he came back to life, it said he revived. I'm not going to go into that a whole argument, but you can notice that. Verse 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house. And delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this, now, uh, now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth. That's true. Life is what God gives. And when Elijah could bring back her dead son to life, she said, Oh, that's God. That's not the devil, that's God. That's our job. Our job is to be breathing life into a dead, wicked world. And it's supposed to make other people see. When a Christian goes into a room of nothing but unsaved person, there should be life that enters that room. Because in reality, that's what happened. Life just walked into a cemetery. That's true. Um, and others should see it and notice something. Now, they may not be as astute as the wicked widow woman and say that that's because of God so let's make sure they know it's because of God Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom in his third year uh, he does something else that's outstanding he sends Levites throughout the territory to teach the law now that's a good thing that's what they're supposed to be doing Levites aren't supposed to be sitting in a temple somewhere um, crossing themselves and, you know, burning candles. <laughs> they were supposed to be out amongst the people teaching them. You know that the Israelites were an educated people in comparison to all the other nations because the other nations didn't know how to write and read. The Israelites did. Why? Because the priests would come around and teach them. They all knew the law. They were supposed to write it on their doorposts. Okay, that means they had to know how to write. Okay, so they were an educated people. They were educated, though, 
from God's point of view, not man's. He's Second uh, Chronicles chapter seventeen, verse seven. Second Chronicles seventeen seven. Second Chronicles seventeen seven. He says, also in the third year of his reign, he sent uh, to his princes, even that guy, ben and Obadiah, and Zechariah, and Nath- that guy, Nathanel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. Okay, he said, my people need to know why we're different. And you do. Christians have come a long way from what America was like a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, a Christian, they raised their family knowing why they were Christian. Not simply, this is a title we wear. No, they knew differences. They knew differences greater than, I'm a Christian, they, they knew differences with the don, denomination. You can ask one person, what's the difference in a Methodist and a Presbyterian? They don't have any clue. You can ask a a person, what's the difference in a Catholic and a Baptist? And they don't have a clue. And in a lot of churches, there ain't much difference. (laughs) And that's the fact, because nobody's teaching. That's the parent's job. That's what he said, I'm going to make sure that my country doesn't turn into a bunch of Know nothings. We're going to send them out. We're going to get some education in here. And it's the job of a parent to cram the Bible down their son or daughter's throat. You've not given that child an option to grow up and choose God if you've not offered it to him. Nothing else is thought of that way. We don't say, my kid really does not like math. I'm not going to force him to learn math. I'm going to let him grow up and decide for himself whether or not he wants to learn math. (laughs) No, sir. We sit him down and we say, what's that timetable? You you memorize that and you repeat it. Oh, you're staying up all night till you know it. Okay? That's the way we treat kids for education. Well, something much more important than knowing your times tables is right here. And we don't care if the kids know it going to be a payday one day. Okay, uh, we better move on. <laughs> he has peace, and that's a good thing. He has peace in Second Chronicles 17, look at verse 10. Second Chronicles 17, 10. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat's presents and tribute silver and uh, Arabians brought some flocks 7,700 rams and 7,700 he goats one thing that's connected real closely with the study of God in the Bible is fear there's no way around it you fear but that's not it don't just think oh I'm always in fear I'm always terrified no there's a, a healthy fear a fear of doing wrong And when you'll get into that, God says, now that fear will be projected. And look at this. The nations around him, the heathens, the wicked people around him are bringing him stuff. They said, not only do we not want to fight with him, we don't want him to get the idea he needs to beat up on us. (laughs) You find the same thing happens in Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay, in the north, Ahab. Ahab's still dealing with Elijah. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal. Elijah is just a man on a mission. He is tearing that place up. He is enemy number one in all the post office. Uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 1. Nobody knows where the post office is anymore. Nobody goes in on it. When I was a kid, yeah, when I was a kid, you went in the post office. Of course, I went in to buy stamps for collecting. Um, but they had the wanted posters up, and they got them at Walmart now, or they did the last 500 years ago when I went into Walmart. I 
Yeah, they used to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They no longer have those right. Yeah, we got to be politically correct. All right, First Kings eighteen, verse one. Um, and Elijah said to Ahab, "Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain." There wasn't any rain yet. Um, First Kings eighteen forty one. I'm sorry. First Kings eighteen forty one. Yeah, the beginning of the chapter, verse 1 to 40, is him challenging the prophets of Baal. I skipped that whole part. So I, I saved y'all from reading 40 verses. Y'all can go home and do it on your own. <laughs> verse 41 is after the he's had the slaughter of all the prophets of Baal. Now he's going to tell Ahab, Hey, now I've got good news for you. You better get to running or you're going to get overtaken by the rain that's coming. Now, there was no rain yet. He just says it's going to rain. Then he does something. Then he's got to get serious about it. He says, I just told the man it's going to rain. And now I don't see it raining. You can read this or you can just note it. Verse 1 to 46 is the story that I'm about to tell you. He says, it's supposed to be raining. God told me it's going to rain. But I don't see any rain. And it's still scorching hot out here I better go pray <laughs> so he goes up and he starts praying he tells his servant okay run down there go at the top of the mountain and see if you see any clouds you know give me the weather report so he does that he runs up there and he says, no, I don't see anything there ain't nothing up here and uh, he comes back he's got to do that seven times and finally he says well I see a little bitty speck of a cloud way out there he said, okay, good. Is it nice and dark? And, you know, got thunderclouds all around. And, no, it's, it's probably about that size. <laughs> about the size of a man's hand. Sure enough, that's the one. When God decides it's going to rain, it's going to rain. But he's not going to give you a whole lot of proof for what he does until he just does it. That's just the way he is. And in the meantime, he lets us sweat it out. You find in James... Um, and I'll have to find it because I didn't put this in here. James, he talks about Elijah. I believe it's the last chapter. Um, yes. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 5. James 5.17. 5, James 5, verse 17. God put these prophets all the time in a tough situation. He shows up to them. We don't get this just by casually reading through. You've got to put your thinking cap on. But a prophet is under some stick, strict guidelines. He says, look, if you prophesy a thing and it doesn't come to pass, the people know you're a false prophet. You're no good. Your name is Mud. So God shows up, tells a prophet to prophesy something. Then he sits back and says, okay, God, it better happen. That's the problem with Jonah. The book of Jonah. Jonah walks into town and he says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. The prophecy was not, if y'all don't get right. No, the prophecy was 40 days and it'll be destroyed. Well, no wonder he was all mad. He just made a false prophecy. I just prophesied 40 days and it's going to be destroyed, and now you're having compassion on them? What do you think that makes me look like? <laughs> so here it is in James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah. He says, Elijah was a, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three uh, years and six months. So, when he told Ahab it's not going to rain till I show up to say so, and God said, you get down there to the brook and don't move till I say so, you better believe he was praying it wasn't going to rain. Every day he woke up and said, Whoo, glad, glad it didn't rain last night. Glad there's no dew on this. Because I gave my word that God said. 
And so he's praying, just don't change your mind. <laughs> okay, that's where we find him. We find he's a real prayer warrior. And God puts us in situations that makes us think, oh, is it really going to happen? You know, is this really going to come through the way, you know, the, I thought it was? The way the Bible says it, and it will. But he likes to hear from us. He likes to hear us talk. So he puts us in those positions. So he, he prays, and finally the drought has been ended. Um, they finally get the rain that they needed, and he has to run down, and he's on foot. And you find this rain is, they're, they're doing this whole thing in the valley of Jehoshaphat, or um, the Jezreel Valley, or Megiddo is what it's called. And, um, of course, every time you see that thing show up, it tells you something about the tribulation. The last half of the tribulation is three and a half years. First half is three and a half years. One of the big things is famine. We saw that Sunday. All right, so there's uh, that. Now in the south, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is doing well. He's got peace. He's been doing the things God's shown him to do. So in uh, 2 Chronicles 17, verse 1. Jehoshaphat fortifies Judah and his army. Just because you got peace doesn't mean it's time to cut the army out. <laughs> that means ramp it up. Make sure you keep peace. Make sure those people know that if they want to start war with you, you're ready. In verse 1, And Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed, uh, and he placed uh, forced in forces, yeah, I can't read, in all the fenced cities of Judah, and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. So he said, look, it's not enough just to have peace, and it's not enough just to be a bunch of happy-go-lucky people. We need to make an army that can stand. And any place that's ours, if we've got a holding there, we need an army there. And that's what he did. Uh, you'll find the same story told in Second uh, Chronicles seventeen twelve to 19. Gives you more information about him fortifying and setting things up. Uh, in the north, the northern kingdom under Ahab, Elijah flees from Jezebel. This is a this is a sad time for Elijah. Elijah has been doing some great stuff, and God's used him mightily, and I'm sure he's just totally bewildered. I would be. Put yourself in his shoes. He shows up, and God says, I've got a message for you. Go tell him it's not going to rain. Okay, now go out in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to take care of you. Then the brook dries up. Now go find a widow that ain't got nothing. You can stay there. <laughs> now go, go tell Ahab, I changed my mind. It's going to start raining. Tell you what, while you're at it, get rid of all the prophets of Baal. Okay? Wild stuff, if it had been us. It doesn't say that he consulted with him. God didn't sit down and say, what do you think we ought to do now? If I make this move, how do you think they're going to react? No, he was just a pawn. You do this. You do that. I can see him getting wore out mentally, and that's exactly what happens. Now he's got a wicked woman after him. That'll work a number on him. In 1 Kings 19, 1-4, we find him fleeing. He runs, and this is where he probably hits the low point of his career. <laughs> Running from this woman. God gives him a command. He instructs him to do three things. He said, He's been telling him one thing at a time. Do this, do this, do this. Now all of a sudden he compounds it on him. I'm going to give you three things to do. I don't like that. You know, I'm simple. Tell me one thing to do. I'll do that. Then I'll tell you when I'm done. Tell me the next thing to do. You tell me ten things. I'll start at the tenth one and t tell you it didn't work. <laughs> Here he is in 1 Kings 19 verse 15. 1 Kings 19, verse 15. 
And the Lord uh, said unto him, Go, return thy way in the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king of Assyria. That's a wild thing, and we've had a whole sermon on it, but he's anointing the king of Syria. That has nothing to do with Jerusalem or Judea or Israel. Uh -uh. But that's what God said, so that's what he has to do. Verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Seraphat, uh, of abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So he's got three things he's got to do. Of those three things, he picks and chooses what sounds good to him. He said, let's see, you gave me three things to do, and the one that really stood out to me was a retirement party in there somewhere. Go anoint somebody that's going to take my place. I'll go do that one. And that's the only one he did. The other two are left undone. So he's about to leave. We're, going, we're not going to see him much more. Ahab, um, uh, I'm not to Ahab just yet. Elijah. <laughs> Elijah is going to anoint Elisha. That's the one job he does complete. And that's a good one. And he does something weird. All these people are so weird in the Bible. Look around at Christians. Guess what? That's a good definition of them. Weird. <laughs> it's okay. The world should think you're weird. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. First Kings 19, 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Saphath. I don't know how you say it. Saphath. Who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Now that is, um, that's a feat there. He's got 12 oxen. Everybody's got a different take on what that really means, but I just like it the way it says it. And, and he with the 12. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. So he throws his shawl over his shoulder. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow thee. There's always some good excuse for not doing what God says to do. Always. The devil will be sure you get one. Not a wicked one. A good moral one. I'm going to go kiss my mother and father and tell them I'm leaving and where I'm going. Seems like a nice thing to do. Here's what he says. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I to do with thee? I don't care about what you've got to do. You know, what I had to do was important, but if you don't think it's important, act like you never saw me. I'm done. Verse 21. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Now, fortunately, he got a do-over. He got a second chance. He had a little grace with him. He didn't just leave him. He said, well, while I'm here, I'll just chop up some of your oxen and make dinner. You better make it a quick kiss. Better, better be a fast goodbye. When I'm done eating, I'm gone. But that's God. God waits on a man, but he doesn't wait forever. A lot of people get under this impression that I've got plenty of time. I'll do right eventually, but for right now, I'm going to go do this convenient thing or that convenient thing. Sometimes God will wait. Sometimes he won't. You find Jesus over there saying, if a man put his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not worthy. So there's no, that's between a man and his God. God decides that thing. So just because you hear the testimony of the man who was a wicked person all their life and then they got miraculously saved, don't count on that for you. That's right. Some people work out that way, but for every one great testimony like that, there's hundreds that didn't, didn't get a second chance. Hey, um, Israel defeats Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, two times. Then Ahab makes a covenant with Ben-Hadad. That'll be in 1 Kings 20. Um, and I'm not going to read it because it's a bunch of verses and I can't read tonight. 
First Corinthians, that'll be First Kings 20, verse 1 to 34. So he's, he's going to team up. He's a wicked man, and he's going to team up with some more wicked men. Wickedness breeds wickedness. He can't hang with the wicked crowd and find good morals. Doesn't work that way. That's not a high priority on their list. Their idea of fun is not the same as God's. That's right. So don't go there thinking that you're going to increase your spirituality. It's not going to happen. So you go there thinking you're going to be a missionary. Now that'll work. That'll work. But any other reason doesn't work. Um, I've got... Man, where... That's too many verses I put down on that one. Uh, okay. Ahab is rebuked for sparing Ben-Hadad. Ahab is told to go destroy this guy that he just teamed up with. And he didn't do it. He should have. We've got to finish our fight. Paul says, I've finished my course. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. God will tell us certain battles to fight. And he doesn't want you to fight it until the other person says uncle. He wants you to fight it until it's smote and slewn. <laughs> smote him and slew him. You find that over and over. When somebody gets killed, they don't just say, and he killed him. They smote him and they slew him. When God wants you to defeat something in your life, he wants you to kill it dead and then kill it again. Just like on the show's when the little helpless girl finds a gun and she shoots the bad guy once, you think, oh, that's not going to work. You empty the gun. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's the way we spiritually should fight until it's done. Here he is, First Kings 20, verse 35. First Kings 20, verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Well, I probably would be too. You know, this is a powerful prophet here. And he says, slap me upside the head. He says, no, you've been out in the sun too long. Verse 36. And he said unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him. A lion found him and slew him. And he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And he said, How many times? Back up and let me have it. <laughs> if you found that the guy who just refused to do what he said just got killed, smoked and slew and eaten up <laughs> by a lion, and he comes to you and says, Now it's your turn? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And the man smote him, so that in smiting, he wounded him. Okay? Yeah, that's the reaction I would have. I'm going to hit you so hard it's going to break my hand, but I'm not going to get eaten by a lion. Verse 38. So the prophet departed and waited for the king, by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. Now take note of that. What he does is he goes and he's waiting on Ahab to come by so he can deliver an object lesson to him. But he does something. It says there he disguised himself. We'll have to remember that because we're not going to make it far enough tonight. But <laughs> Toward the end of Ahab's life, that's his demise. Ahab disguises himself. Here he is, the prophet. Uh, he dis disguised himself. Verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. So you understand what's going on. He said, You're going to watch this guy. If anything happens to him, if he dies... You're going to die. <laughs> Verse 40. And as the servant uh, was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. 
Did you agree to that bargain? Don't get me involved in this thing. You'll get what you deserve. Careful what you answer. Four, verse 41. And he hasted and took off the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was the prophet. Verse 42. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. When God tells you to finish a battle, you better finish it. He may decide, okay, you didn't want to finish that, I'll finish you. So when we fight a battle, fight it to the end. A lot of the Christian life is doing the hard thing. And when you step up to do the hard thing, it'll be putting the flesh down saying, I'm an idiot, I don't feel like doing this, I gotta do it anyway, and I'm just gonna do it. God, you have to take care of this because I'm being an idiot here and I'm just doing it because you said to. Once you take that step, he comes in and it'll be all right. But it's hard to make those steps. Those are tough ones to do, but you got to do it because you could end up in this guy's position. God says, okay, I, I gave you a chance to do something. You didn't do it. You didn't finish it. There's a whole world of people out there nowadays who have never finished anything. Never finished. We got a lot of good starters. They'll start something, but they won't finish it. Prime example. I, I hate to use this again, but I don't really because I love to use it. Um, <laughs> the Bible. How many people have started and said, I'm going to read the Bible? and have never read it through. Okay, a bunch of starters. Those are losers. <laughs> if you've not finished, you're still a loser. When you finish, now yeah, you've done something. You completed something. That's good. Be a completer. You'll find it in your spiritual life, and it'll be simple things. Now, the, the Bible issue, that's one of those things that should be a basic. We're Christians. We have one book, the Bible. It's broken up into 66 books, but we have one thing that defines Christianity for a real Christian, not a Catholic, and it's the Bible. So we had better read that book. You know, the rest of it, don't tell me about your church membership because there's a million different denominations and people meeting on different days and, you know, everybody's got a different idea of church. Okay, let's throw that one out the window. Let's go down to basics. Have you read the book? You read the manual? Okay. You haven't? What's your plan to do that? Okay, well then, you said you're a Christian? Isn't Christianity built on a book? And you hadn't read the book? You're not a Christian yet. Come talk to me again next year. <laughs> All right, we better stop it there. I'll get rabid on Bible reading. <laughs>